My name is Skip Masbach, and I am the director of the Adolescent Faith and Flourishing Program at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And this is a collaboration of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, Yale Divinity School, the Berkeley Divinity School, and the Youth Ministry Initiative. And what I mostly want to say is thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do in ministering to youth. And thank you for joining us today. Our aspiration across our program, I hope you've got a brochure so you can see the cool speakers that we've got. I mean, we're off to kind of a slow start with Andy Root, but we're going to pick it up. <laughs> we're going to pick it up next month with uh, Chap Clark, I promise. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful series of speakers. It's a free lunch. You can't hate that. Mostly what I hope we experience together is an evolution of a community, a community of folks who are passionate about ministering to our youth. You know this, so I'm not telling you something you don't know. It's easy to say youth are the future of the church. What's true is they are the vital present of the church, and you are the frontline folks helping to form faith amongst these incredible young people that we're blessed to have in our churches. So a notion of community, I hope we're not all clicked up at denominational tables. We're going to have to do icebreakers, you know how those go in youth group, if, if you do that. Because we have a rich opportunity to talk, to meet, to learn from one another across the next eight months as we do this series first Tuesday of every month. I hope that uh, you'll stay in connection with us. If you haven't already, join our Facebook page at Youth Ministry Now. Check out our what's going to evolve as a distance learning resource where all these videos will be posted at www.youthministryinitiative.org. And basically, the role of the Youth Ministry Initiative, which is this collaboration, is to support what you're doing, to resource what you're doing, to research and develop deep theological and scriptural foundations to enrich what you're doing, and to keep us going, because this can be an isolating job, but it shouldn't be. We should be gathering like this more often and taking energy and strength and just sheer fun from gathering together. Now, every single second I speak, I'm taking time away from Andy Root, and he tends to go on anyway. So, so I'm going to try to keep this short. I have a couple of introductions. First, a great deal of gratitude uh, to Dean Joe Britton, who really gave us this start by giving us a footprint and a partnership at Berkeley last year. Dean, thank you. Berkeley's thrilled to be able to uh, participate in supporting this and welcome everybody. Welcome back to many of you. Um, the room we're in is the old refectory, partially renovated, going to be a swing space for the opera and drum program at the music school while they renovate their space. So uh, don't think this is the uh, uh, current state of Yale Divinity School. We are far beyond this. Just a word of explanation. Welcome. Thank you, Joe. Another part of the youth ministry initiative will be to resource and then to drive support for youth ministry across our, our various denominations. And I have a co-conspirator who has already foolishly signed up for this, who's going to help us coordinate and support youth ministry throughout the Episcopalian tradition. Michael Bird, Father Michael Bird, would you stand up just so people can put a name together as a face? The rector at Bronxville. So if you're wearing a collar and you're not a Roman Catholic, you'll be hearing from him, or, or, or Lutheran, you'll be hearing from Father Michael Bird. Uh, we are recruiting. If you are from any of the other traditions, we had 14 traditions joining us last year, 140 folks from 14 traditions, everything from Roman Catholic nuns and habits to Buddhist monks in garb. So we have a diverse group. If you would like to help coordinate for your denomination, please come see me. So I'm going to say a grace because I see everybody's eating here. But by the power invested in me in ordination and laying on of hands, I'm going to do a retroactive grace. So let's pray. Uh, gracious God, we offer a word of thanks to you. We thank you for your calling, your claim on each of the lives of the folks of this room to minister to children who were, after all, your children before they were our children. Uh, we thank you for this calling, and we thank you for the faithful response of the folks into this room. We pray that you'll continue to bless our gatherings. We ask you to bless this food on the hands that prepared it. May our time together be pleasing to you and generative in the ministry into the world. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I really could go on a great length about Andy Root, and he doesn't want me to because, again, I'm picking his pocket for time. Andy Root is a really extraordinary uh, generator of intellectual capital, thought leader for youth ministry throughout the country, 
uh, holds a chair in youth ministry and family ministry at Luther Seminary in St. Paul. You've seen the rest of the biography. I'm not going to go on because I want him up here. Really grateful, Andy, for you coming east. It's yours. All right, it is a uh, pleasure to be back here, and I'm just going to jump in, and this is a very kind of, it's a great room to see you all here, but I also, we're talking about screens, and ironically, I have to teach off a screen, so just keep the irony going as we go here today. But I do want to talk about uh, living in a screen-based world, which seems like if there's one thing true about the young people that we are uh, working with, is that they live in a screen-based world, that they have their phones or their computer screens up all the time. Uh, I actually had a youth worker who told me uh, not too long ago that they did a fall retreat and kids were actually asked to hand in their cell phones before they made it to the camp and kids were using dummy cell phones so that they would hand in a cell phone that was, wasn't working so they could keep their cell phone. And he actually talked to some of these kids and they had utter anxiety of giving up their cell phone. And then, of course, their parents didn't want them to give them up either so they could contact them and text them and things like that. But it seems like we live in this really significant world where our screen is everywhere. And I even know some youth workers who work in uh, South Africa, and they say one of the most interesting things is you go into townships, um, incredibly poor townships, and you will look inside of um, some of these habitats these people are living in, and there'll be kids with cell phones, with smartphones, watching English Premier Soccer or something. That the screen has permeated globally in many sense. Now, it's easy to be critical of that or to want to push back against that, but I had to admit, especially living in Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, in the middle of February, and if you've ever been there in the middle of February, may God have mercy on your soul. It is cold, and I realized one February a few years back that my whole world was really framed by two screens, that I spent my whole life either laying on my living room floor watching TV or in my office um, rubbing a piece of plastic on a table to bounce in and out of worlds. That's my mouse. It's not something dirty. It sounds dirty. Um, but uh, that my whole world was framed either by 46 inches that I wish was 60 or 13 inches. That my whole world was framed that way. And I started to wonder with the young people I work with as well as myself how this changes meaning. How is meaning constructed differently in a screen-based world? Now, one night when I was actually watching TV, my favorite late night talk show is Jimmy Kimmel Live. I love Jimmy Kimmel. And if you ever watch Jimmy Kimmel um, on at at least 11 central time, that he always has a big musical artist at the end. And this particular night, he had Kanye West, America's favorite narcissist, was actually uh, on his show. He had just released his album. He was very significant at this time. And I want to show you just about 10, 15 seconds of this performance. And what I want you to look at are the young people in the first five to six rows. What do you see with these young people as you watch this 15 seconds of this concert? All right, so can you see it? Pretty obvious. So here are these kids at this real event. The biggest music, musical artist is just a stone's throw away from them, and here they are taking it in through their two-inch or three-inch screen. They're at the real event, but yet are choosing to take it in through their screen. So what does this mean, that we are actually mediating reality often, and our young people are, through screens. Well, what I want to actually talk about this afternoon, and this is dangerous, I want to talk to you about maybe one of the preeminent um, French philosophers on post-modernity, post Jean Baudrillard. 
Now, I realize whenever you say a post-modern uh, French philosopher, it's like tryptophan's in it. It's like after Thanksgiving, <laughs> you just get super tired. Like, did he really say this? I'm, I'm done. All right. Now, the truth is, is that all of you have run into the name, most of you, I'm sure, have run into the name Jean Baudrillard before. If you have ever seen The Matrix, which it is, let me give you another point, it is really lame to talk about The Matrix um, in, in your ministry. So don't say to kids like, hey, remember The Matrix in 1997? Wasn't that cool, kids? <laughs> like, I wasn't born yet. Uh, so having said that, now I can talk about it. Um, if, you, if you remember The Matrix and one of America's great, greatest actors, Keanu Reeves, is in that first scene. <laughs> and if you've watched Keanu, you know he can only do one thing. Whoa, that's all Keanu can do. So if you remember, Keanu's in this room at the very beginning of the Matrix, and it's this dark, damp room, and he gets a knock on the door, and he goes to it. It looks like there's a drug deal going down, but it isn't actually a drug deal. He actually goes to the safe and pulls out a book and opens the book, and it's hollowed out, and there are some discs in it or something, and he gives these people the discs. The book he takes out and opens up is John Baudrillard's book, Simulation and Simulacra. Now, the Wolkowski brothers who wrote this movie were inspired by Baudrillard's work and his cultural critique. Now, Baudrillard heard that before he had died. He'd, he'd read that and watched the movie. And as a good French philosopher, he said, this American movie is drivel. My work is so much more significant than this. <laughs> but it, it was inspiring. And what Baudrillard's basic point is, is he thinks it's become hard for us, actually, in our cultural context in Western societies, to construct meaning because we are bombarded by images. There are images everywhere that we are actually drowning in images. And he makes this argument that it's actually hard to construct meaning when we are drowning by images. Now why he thinks that is because he thinks that we make structure, or we make meaning through a structure, and particularly language, and the structure is signed to the thing it signifies. That the way we go about making meaning is signed to the thing it signifies. Now this is my daughter. See, you people are cruel. You're supposed to say, ah, oh, come on. I thought people on the East Coast were nice. That's what us Midwesterners think. Um, so this is my daughter when she was about seven, eight months. And we have two dogs. Don't ask me why we have two dogs. We have a black Labrador and a golden retriever. And the golden retriever is as dumb as the day is long, but he's loving as can be. But my daughter, um, ever since she was even a little infant, has loved these dogs. And she, whenever she would see them, she would glee with delight. Well, around seven or eight months, she actually learned the sign for these four-legged animals that allow her to jump on them and lick her face. And so she would see them and she would glee, Dogga, dogga, dogga. She learned the sign to signify the real thing, four-legged furry animal. And she started to make meaning with this. So we would take her on a walk and she would see a dog three or four blocks away and she would glee and shout, Dogga, dogga, dogga. Um, so she was constructing meaning. Now, my wife has a friend, and they had their firstborn children around the same time, so they're forever linked. And uh, her friend lives in Atlanta now, and she often makes her, like, mixed CDs and sends it to her, which I think is so cute. And so, like, 1990s, you know, to make a mixtape. And it's often half the songs are, like, children's songs, and then half are, like, old classic rock songs. And my wife will play for my kids, and these volumes of... Uh, CDs sent by her friend become kind of lore in our family. Well, one of the CDs actually had the Queen song on it, We Will, We Will Rock You, you know, dun, dun, ch, dun, dun, ch. Well, my son, probably about five or six at the time, he called it the Blood on Your Face song. You got blood on your face, you're a big disgrace. But my daughter, she's, you know, three at the time, my daughter was calling it the baby song. And it would come on, she'd go, oh, oh, the baby song is on, the baby song is on. And we had no idea why she was calling it the baby song until about two weeks later it dawned on us, we will, we will rock you. Oh. So here she is, she knows the sign, rock, but she's not sophisticated with language enough to know that rock could mean to rock or to rock. Um, she doesn't know that yet, but she's making meaning with it. She makes it wrong, she doesn't make it correctly, but she actually is constructing meaning. So when we asked her if she wanted to go see the movie How to Train Your Dragon, she said, yes, will there be a choo-choo in it? She, again, isn't sophisticated with language enough to know that train could mean to prepare or to teach, or it could mean big iron machine that goes on tracks. But she's constructing meaning. Now, Baudrillard's point, actually, is that we're so bombarded by images that this structure gets broken down that the sign to the thing it signifies gets broken down, and we actually choose the sign, the image becomes more important. So another example, there's my son. Good, so you guys can take a cue. All right, so there's my son, and he was about 
four at this time. And there's this picture here. It's this idyllic picture of him running. It was at a wedding we were at, this like kitschy wedding in Wisconsin at this old farmhouse. And he's running in this field with this other little girl chasing him. And it's beautiful. And when I think back to that wedding, that's what I remember. The truth of that event, if I can get back to it, is he was a little pain in the... Uh, I wanted to strangle a kid. He wouldn't sit down. Um, he, he wouldn't do anything. But it doesn't matter anymore because it's captured in the image. And I would rather live in the image than the real experience itself. <laughs> Won't we, won a lot of us. So the, Baudrillard's point is the sign becomes disconnected from the thing it signifies. That we actually choose the image over the real thing. And of course, the greatest example of this is advertising. I mean... Who cares what the thing does? It's what the thing means. I mean, talk to kids at your youth group the next time you meet and ask them if they wear the tennis shoes they wear because, well, they have good soles and they're going to last a long time. It's a good value. No, you put that Nike swoosh on because of what it means. Uh, that it's a sign that you take on for actually what it means. Kids wear what they wear um, because of actually what it means. So I want to show you just a couple minutes of a documentary that gets at this sign becoming disconnected from the thing it signifies. And it comes from a front line. Um, and listen for how the sign becomes disconnected from the thing it signifies. Not so long ago, the high contact ads of today were all but unthinkable. Soap has never smelled this good before, and neither have you. Ads laid claim to real, tangible differences between one product and another. What were brands? They were based on what I call ER words. Whiter, brighter, cleaner, stronger. Smoothest, mildest, tastiest cigarette. Watch any commercials on American TV, and you'll see these words up in the first three seconds, hammered remorselessly into your brain. But at some point, these words cease to have meaning. We no longer believed that one product was any brighter or cleaner than any other. Everything works now, you know, french fries taste crisp, coffee's hot, you know, uh, beer tastes good, unless you live in America, and then, you know, you've got to live with what you get. But all these things now are table stakes. By the early 1990s, a new approach to marketing came to the fore, one that leapt right over what the product did to what the product meant. You know, it's not just a car, it's an expression of the culture, um, an aesthetic that is connected somehow to nature, infinity. These were the super brands like Nike, um, Starbucks, the body shop. And what they noticed these brands had in common was that they were, uh, they, they, they were engaging in a kind of a sort of pseudo-spiritual marketing. So Nike said that they were about the meaning of sports, but more than that, that they were about transcendence through sports. Starbucks said that they were about the idea of community, a place that is a third place, that is not home, not work. Benetton was, of course, selling uh, multiculturalism, racial diversity. This lesson, that a brand could forge an emotional, even spiritual bond with today's cynical consumer, wasn't lost on corporate America. When I was a brand manager at Procter & Gamble, my job was basically to make sure the product was good, develop new advertising copy, design the pack. Now a brand manager has an entirely different kind of responsibility. In fact, they have more responsibility. Their job now is to create and maintain a whole meaning system for people through which they get identity and understanding of the world. Their job now is to be a um, community leader. This summer, we invited everyone who owns a Saturn to visit us in Tennessee, the place their car was born. And that's the object of emotional branding, to fill the empty places where non-commercial institutions like schools and churches might have once done the job. Brands become more than just a mark of quality. They become an invitation to a longed-for lifestyle, a ready-made identity. When you listen to brand managers talk, um, you can get quite carried away in this idea that they actually are fulfilling these needs that we have for community and narrative and, and transcendence. But, but in the end, it is you know, a laptop and, 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 and a pair of running shoes. And you, they might be great, but they're not actually going to fulfill those, those needs. So you see the point, that the sign becomes disconnected from the thing it signifies. What matters is the image, not the real thing anymore. It's a, it's a pretty profound line when he says, and that's the point of emotional branding. 
to fill the places where once non-commercial institutions like churches and schools used to. And I have to admit this for myself. When I'm on an airplane and I have to talk to somebody, which I usually put up every sign that says, I don't speak the language, don't talk to me. Um, but when I have to talk to somebody, I would much rather talk to them about Apple um, and the new iPhone than I would want to talk to them about my family or my church. Um, that I would much rather do that, that we get sucked into this. But Baudrillard's point is that these are often, especially when it comes to advertising, they're just signs that are supposed to signify things. But now they become disconnected and the sign becomes the point. They're supposed to be pathways, but now they become the very currency we use to construct meaning with. So this leads us into the, it's not that there's no meaning, but there's so much meaning to construct. There's these signs that are free floating that we use to construct meaning. And we end up using prepared realities to construct meaning. And by prepared realities, I mean the things um, that we see on sound stages and on websites, they become what we use to actually construct meaning. So for instance, people know, tend to know more about their favorite celebrity or their favorite sports stars, young people do for sure, than they know about their family history. Um, they, they tend to know um, those narratives more than they know the narratives of their own history. It's interesting, in cultural studies, they've, they've done this research in the field of cultural studies, and they found that um, they went into some communities, some Eastern European communities, and they interviewed people after a certain major cliffhanger had happened in the local soap opera. So it's a soap opera, so you know, something really terrible happened, like someone fell down a well, and at the bottom of the well was a tiger and their evil twin. You know, like something really plausible happened. But this was, you know, what happened in the local soap opera. The interesting thing is they would interview the village pastor, and the village pastor would get prayer requests, not for the actress, but for the character of the soap opera. That the, that the, the church prayer requests were being filled by prayer requests for this this actor. So what, what's real and what's not real? That we kind of confuse this. There's a pop star named Lily Allen and she has this song called The Fear and I, she's very well known in the UK and you may not know her here which makes me feel really cool. Like see this is a UK artist that you don't know about. Uh, but she has this song called The Fear and this is one of the lines. She says, life's about film stars and less about mothers. And then she says, but it doesn't matter because I'm packing plastic and that's what makes my life so effing fantastic. Now, it is always dangerous to exegete a pop star's lyrics. <laughs> but at the first line, the first thing that we know is life's more about film stars and less about mothers. I mean, in a real way, that's true for her. I mean, Angelina Jolie has a new movie every 9 to 16 months. Her mother, well, she lives with her for a while, and she kicks her out because she's going to move in with this guy. And then she moves in with, her, with someone else, and then she moves back with her mom, but then her mom moves away. I mean, Angelina Jolie or a Brad Pitt movie, those are more consistent than her own family. The hyper-real is more real um, than her own family. But then she says, it doesn't matter because I'm packing plastic. And like I said, we probably shouldn't exegete this, but it means one of two things. Either she has a credit card with a major credit limit on it, or she has had her, her breast enhanced. And that becomes, the me, that becomes the measure of what makes her life so fantastic. Again, the unreal becomes the measure of what's real. Or this show, all of us have seen Friends, right? I was much more of a Seinfeld guy when they were on. And my wife, though, was huge into Friends. She loved Friends. And we were living in L.A. at the time, and she actually went to a couple tapings of Friends. And one night we were watching it right in the right when it was at its best um, and Seinfeld was going to follow it. And after a great episode, my wife leaned back on the couch and gave this sigh of satisfaction and said, I just love this show. I just feel like Rachel and Phoebe are my friends. And I gave her this look like, you will never live that comment down. <laughs> and so I gave her the needle every chance I could. And at that time, um, Bur the Burbank Airport, when you would land in it, they actually had like cardboard cutouts of celebrities that when you look through your window, you can look into the terminal and you could see them. And they had the Friends characters. So whenever we'd land in Burbank, I would nudge Cara and say, Cara, your friends are here to welcome you back to LA. <laughs> she never, ever, she didn't, she didn't like that. But she also was in a baby group when our kids were young in our neighborhood, these parents who would get together and commiserate on raising small toddlers and you know, spike their coffee to get through the day. Um, <laughs> And one, one week, this woman comes in. She says, i got to tell you this story. She says, I'm so embarrassed by this. She said, I was at work this week, and uh, it was a Monday, and I was in my cubicle, and a friend of mine came up to me and told me what they had done over the weekend. And it just triggered something in me immediately. And I said, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, that happened to one of my friends. And she said, I started telling them what had happened to one of my friends that connected to what happened to them. And she said, about halfway through... To my shock, I turned white and I started to sweat because I realized I was not 
telling a story of something that happened to one of my friends. I was recapping a plot from the TV show Friends. <laughs> that the meaning had been blurred. That she actually felt more connected to the narratives she saw in these prepared realities than the, her own narratives. And she, couldn't, she, she had a hard time distinguishing what one was real and what one wasn't. That these things get blended, which is Baudrillard's point. So simulation now becomes life. And we make meaning with simulation. Not necessarily with the real, but with simulations. Simulations like models and celebrities and web pages and profiles. I mean, if you work with particularly junior high um, young women, you know this is true in the sense that a model is not a real woman's body. A model is a simulation of a real woman's body. But nearly every 15-year-old girl wishes their body looked like the simulation. And you can talk to them for days. You can cut out as many pictures out of a magazine and, and paste it on a piece of paper, but you're always shocked because you can get done teaching about this and then they get one comment that they're fat and they, cr they crumble. Or and, they, and they can even say through their tears, I know this shouldn't matter to me. I know it doesn't matter, but it just hurts so bad because they live in a cultural context where the image is the real. The image is what matters. So you can logically tell them it shouldn't matter, but the simulation has become what's captivating in what they make meaning with. And again, it's only a simulation. It is not a real woman's body, but it becomes the measure of what actually is real. And we should be careful not to think, oh, these dumb kids. This is just young people. This is true in presidential politics. You don't have a chance to be, um, at, at least after the, the, the Nixon... Um, uh, Kennedy debate, you don't have a chance to be president if you don't what, first and foremost? Look presidential. You have to look presidential. Um, I don't know if you guys remember back in the dark ages of the OJ um, cultural uh, trial in the OJ chase. You remember the OJ chase? Um, some of you are too young to remember that. Um, but when OJ got into his uh, white Bronco and went through the streets of Brentwood and then got on the 405 and had, headed down, um, if you lived in LA post the OJ trial, it changed everything because this was the first time extensively that they had a helicopter over and would, they broke into uh, regular broadcasting. And now after that, they realized that the numbers went up for car chases. So if you live in LA, even now, it, they'll, break into, they'll break into the Super Bowl for a car chase. I mean, the, because people voyeuristically want to watch this. But one of the most interesting things is they did a research study because they noticed when OJ was going through in his white Bronco through the streets of Brentwood that people were running out on the street with handheld TV sets waving at the camera above. So they got some of these people and they interviewed them and asked them why they did that. Well, what they found is that people said that the reason they ran out on the street was because they thought this was a historical event. And then they asked them, why did you bring a handheld TV set with you? And they basically articulated that they needed the TV set to, um, to, to articulate, to, they needed the TV set to verify that they were having an historical event that it wasn't a true historical event unless it was on TV. And the same thing happened when the Berlin Wall came down, that people ran out with handheld TV sets, that the TV, that the image verified the real, that it became more real than the real thing. So when this happens, Baudrillard says, we enter into the realm of a simulacra. Now, unless you're a vocab nerd, you either think this is one of those fancy made up academic words, um, or else uh, you, know, you don't know that this is actually a real word. And actually, a simulacra is simply, uh, by definition, it's a simulation that's lost its trail of breadcrumbs back from its original. So it's a simulation that we no longer connect back to its original. The best example of this, of course, is your computer. Um, Apple and the Macintosh changed everything in computing because it used simulations to make their operating system. Um, so if I even said to you right now, like, oh, I had a handout for you guys, but I left it on my desktop, most of you, your minds would not go to some hard desktop, some real desktop. You would go right to my, you'd think of my computer screen. Or if I said, oh, I had that, but I left it in a file. You wouldn't think, oh, it's in some file in a photo or in a, uh, in a cabinet. You would think, oh, yeah, on his computer. That it's become a simulacra. It was, a, it was originally just a simulation, but now our minds immediately go to that. So think of this in the context of our young people. A show like The Hills, um, which if this was a huge show, particularly with young adults, becomes a simulacra. Now young people watch this show about these young adults in um, the Hollywood Hills to figure out what it means to be a young adult. I mean, they already are a young adult, but they use this as the very measure for what it means to be a young adult. Or think of this show, uh, Newport Harbor, which now I'm just confessing my MTV sins to you, so you can pray for me. Um, but it was on MTV, and it was actually a spinoff of 
uh, uh, Laguna Beach, which actually the Hills is a spin off of that, but you don't need to know that. Um, you just need to know I watch way too much TV. Um, but it's all for research purposes. That's what I tell people. Um, but this was a show about these high school kids in uh, Newport, California. Um, and for the most part, they were just regular kids. I mean, they were beautiful, but there are beautiful kids in every high school in America. Um, and they lived in a beautiful place in Newport Beach. But what, of course, happens is MTV shows up, it records their life. It edits it down, makes it into an image, edits it down into 22 minutes, broadcasts it around the country, and these are no longer kids. These are images. Images that other kids consume to figure out what it means to be a kid. I mean, they already are kids. They are already real kids, but they use the image to figure out what to wear, how to talk, um, what, what they should think about certain things, that they, this becomes a simulacra. It becomes so weird now that um, there's layers and layers of simulation that after these shows you can go on to MTV.com and play a video game where you hang out with these people, which I just don't get. Maybe I'm too old for this or something, but I understand playing a video game where you're a wide receiver for the Jets or you get to kill vampires or something, but I don't get playing a video game where you get to be a kid. I mean, you already are a kid, but no, you can get to go in there and they give you like 500 virtual MTV bucks to hang out with these people. So watch this. This is at the very end of the hills. And watch the levels of simulation on this. Next time on the hill. You're running a show tonight. It's really important. I am counting on you to make this a success. Oh, are those for me? Happy 21st birthday, Bud Spencer. <laughs> I'm actually from uh, Orange County. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> you have to see the 390 people in 15 minutes. Okay. Go. We're ready to go. Ready oh, to Lauren's ready. Right. Hi, are you there? They said we're ready to start. Lauren. All right, here we go. Lauren. You can dance, party, try on new fashions, and enter the Hills Rewind Contest. You could win 500 virtual MTV bucks. Hi, this is Whitney. Come hang out with me in the virtual Hills. All right, those are some inc intense levels of simulation. So they, that show itself is a simulation, and then you can go and play a video game where you, what's the appeal? Where actually you become a sign and interact with these other signs. Um, and I think this says a lot about how celebrity culture works. And if there's one thing true about our culture and true about the young people that we work with, that celebrity culture is huge. And the thing about a celebrity is that a celebrity, isn't, for the most part, is no longer a person. A celebrity is a sign. A celebrity is a sign that we use to consume to figure out how we should cut our hair, how we should act, how we should talk, and that makes them incredibly powerful. But it doesn't necessarily make them people. They're signs that we consume to figure these things out. It's interesting, I think, when you ask most young people, and my own son is this way, um, what he really wants to be when he grows up, um, and you talk to young people you work with, everybody, you know, this, this culture is built on it's really important to be rich, that you really want to be rich. Rich is good. But more importantly than being rich in this cultural context is being a celebrity. Because if you're a celebrity, you have real power. Because now people consume your image to figure out how to, how to walk, how to talk, how to act. That becomes incredibly significant. I don't know, now I'm really confessing my MTV sins, but did anyone ever watch My Super Sweet 16? You know this show? Some of you that know it are laughing. It, is, uh, it was a very stomach-turning show. It was about these mainly young women, and they were all 15 turning 16, and we're going to have their sweet 16 birthday party. And their parents were filthy rich. So they would spend between twenty and two hundred thousand dollars on this sweet sixteen party, and so these girls were already very, very wealthy. But the most interesting thing about almost every one of the shows is the way these young women would construct their birthday party was they would construct it for them to be a celebrity. They would have a photo shoot. They would arrive on a white horse. They would actually bring in, they would have their parents pay for some artist to sing at their birthday party, and they would get up on stage with them. That it wasn't enough just to be rich, but to be actually a celebrity. Now, this will not, I'm going to give you a warning, this will not hold up in the court of law, so don't try this. But it may just be actually that the celebrity stalker does something more healthy than the rest of us. Again, this won't hold up in the court of law, so don't be thinking, I love Brad Pitt. I, thank you. I'm going to go stalk him right now. But the interesting thing about the celebrity stalker is the celebrity stalker says, I love Brad Pitt. I have every one of his pictures on my wall. I've read everything about him. I love Brad Pitt. I demand that the sign signify itself. So you drive to Hollywood. You go through his garbage. You wait for him outside of his, his compound, and you try to interact with him. The rest of us, we don't do that. We, we just figure that it's a sign, we, we consume it, and when we're done with it, we discard it. We don't actually ask the sign to signify itself, which is why we can so easily discard them when we're done with them. Like Britney Spears, 
Britney Spears, we're, we can't wait for Britney Spears to have another implosion and go crazy because she's not a real person. She's a sign that we can consume and get rid of quickly. So it may just be that the celebrity stalker actually does something healthier than the rest of us. But like I said, that won't hold up in the court of law. So don't say, hey, this guy at Yale Divinity School said that this was a healthy thing to do. It won't work. Um, it's interesting that Baudrillard himself got in a lot of trouble because um, he wrote an op-ed during the first Iraq war in the Paris newspaper. And he actually said the Iraq war, the, the first Iraq war, he says, it is not happening. It is not real. And his reason he said that, of course, made people incredibly angry because real money was being spent, real people were dying. But his point is, this war is being fought on video screens, first and foremost. But his second main point of his op-ed was uh, a case that happened uh, that he encountered on CNN. That CNN was in Atlanta interviewing a general to talk about what was happening on the ground um, in Iraq. And they were talking about it, and then they said, now let's go on the ground in Kuwait with our embedded reporters. And they went on the ground, and something happened with the, the feed, and they caught the CNN reporters watching CNN to report what was happening on the ground. And Baudrillard's point is, what is real? Life has become about consuming images to consume images. Is there anything real in the midst of this at all? So the truth is, is we've always had these simulations. It's just now that the simulation, um, that we now choose to live in the simulation more than in real life. And we have people who would rather live inside simulations than the real life. My son, we allow him to, uh, he's really into TV and he's really into video games. And we allowed him when he was five or six to play a half hour of Star Wars Lego um, every weekend day. Um, I, don't, we figure, I don't know if you've ever seen this, the Lego games. It makes you as a parent feel good. Like, oh, my kid's shooting things, but they're just Legos. Um, it's, it's classic justification. But we'd let him play for a half hour, but it was my terrible job to go upstairs and turn off the PlayStation when he was done. And the, the five-year-old rage was intense. And one day I turned it off, and he looked at me with the greatest frustration he could find, and he said, Daddy, Daddy, real life isn't fun. I wish I could just live inside Star Wars Lego. I just wish I could live inside of it. And you think about that, that there's ways that people actually really believe that, or really desire that. And the image becomes so full-blown that we're sucked into it. I want to show you a very humorous clip that comes from The Onion that talks about these simulations on top of simulations. celebrated this week as a hotly anticipated sequel to the popular online video game World of Warcraft hit the shelves. Onion News Network Tech Trends has the story. World of Warcraft. It has 9 million players worldwide, many who say they spend hundreds of hours playing the game every week. Here at the Blizzard Entertainment offices, creators say they couldn't be any more excited about the new expansion pack, World of World of Warcraft. Jonathan Parrish is the vice president of Blizzard Entertainment. World of World of Warcraft allows Warcraft gamers to do what they like to do more than anything else in life, which is play World of Warcraft. Blizzard programmer Chris Boldman demonstrated how the game works. So here I'm playing as a character named Greg who's playing World of Warcraft as a level 3 known rogue. So uh, I'm going to press my up arrow key, and that's going to make him press his up arrow key, which is going to make the character on his screen kind of move forward across the screen. What this game is going to do is put you in the shoes of someone, imagining they're in the shoes of a, an elf, a dwarf, a mage, a troll. The fan response has been great. The game sold over 100,000 copies its first day of release. My avatar is the biggest World of Warcraft fan in the whole World of World of Warcraft world. The game promises to bring a level of realism to video gaming never before seen. Here, I'm going to press Alt-Shift-7. And that's going to make uh, my character uh, start scrolling through the terms of use agreement <laughs> and then use your license agreement. And it's fun to just play a character who's getting lost in this whole other sort of fantasy world. The graphics are amazing. Uh, they're revolutionary. I mean, when you're, when you're staring at the computer screen, you actually believe that you're in a dimly lit basement staring at a computer screen. With each keystroke, you're just like, oh my god, it sounds exactly like the keystrokes that I know from my own personal experience of hitting keys. Based on the game's big success, <laughs> Blizzard Entertainment is already looking ahead to their next release planned for fall of 2009. Fans love World of World of Warcraft, and we know they're going to want their characters to be able to play the game as well, so we've already started work on World of World of Warcraft, the World of Warcraft round. For the Onion News <laughs> Network, I'm Jeff Tate. When we come back, an Atlanta man mauled by a pit bull puppy describes the adorable attack. <laughs> All right, so I think you get, you get the point, that the, that the simulation becomes so full-blown. 
that we actually live inside of it. And then they're making fun of the fact that it ran news stories of young people who were losing jobs, not going to school because they just wanted to live inside of these games and felt more comfortable inside of them. So simulation has overcome the real. And maybe this is one of the reasons, actually, if, especially if you've um, been in seminary classes and Old Testament seminary classes or learn Hebrew um, or um, know people who can kind of conservative traditional Jews, that one of the things you're not supposed to say the name Yahweh. Because I think they understood that the name, that the sign could be disconnected from the thing that signifies. That if you just flippantly say it over and over again, you can disconnect it. Or when young people th- say things like, you know, I don't like to share my clothes. I'm just a real Nazi when it comes to my clothes. Then it's over. That Nazi no longer refers to totalitarian government that exterminated over six million people. It means you're kind of mean and you're kind of grumpy. So it might just be that some of the most dangerous things we can allow our kids to actually consume and participate in are things like this. And I know every young pastor loves the kitschy Jesus stuff because it's so humorous. But you start to wonder if the sign of Jesus as the white guy with perfectly conditioned hair overtakes the real And all of a sudden, who Jesus is is just this simulation of this kind of a religious person that doesn't mean anything anymore. So when simulation becomes more captivating than the real, we enter into what's called the hyper-real. We find ourselves um, in the hyper-real. Now, I don't know if any of you are football fans, but uh, two seasons ago, Samsung was advertising their TV on every commercial break of the NFL that uh, the new, their new flat screen, one-inch TV, which did make me want it deeply, um, but I love TV. Um, but th- their whole point was move from the real to the hyper real. And they meant this as a, like a positive marketing hook. But actually, Baudrillard means it as a negative thing. That when we winter into the hyper real, it becomes really hard for us to determine actually what is real itself. So example of the hyper real, uh, Skip and I were talking about he loves 30 Rock, and there's a great line from 30 Rock. Have you ever seen the NBC show 30 Rock? Alec Baldwin plays Jack Donaghy, who's the kind of CEO he was of GE, now it's Cable Town or whatever. And Tina Fey is running the show. And um, so Tina, Fey, uh, Tina Fey's character, Liz Lemon, is in with Alec Baldwin. And Alec Baldwin's character, Jack Donaghy, says, um, Liz Lemon, do you understand that I have front row seats to the Yankees, to the Knicks, um, and to the Rangers? Do you know what that's like? That's like having a huge HDTV screen right in front of your face. The hyper real. <laughs> And even Apple now is advertising the new retina screen is finer than the human eye can pick up. And you wonder when we'll just want to walk around and see the world through our images themselves. Or maybe a more real life example of this, um, when the shrine to Jerry Jones opened, the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, and they had their first preseason game, they ran into two problems. And they both had to do with the scoreboard. The first was that the kicker kept kicking the ball into the scoreboard, but they refused to move the scoreboard because the scoreboard was constructed on two 60-yard HD, fully 1080, wonderful screens. But the bigger issue was that when they were playing the, the game, they realized very quickly they could not put the live coverage up on the screen because everyone in the stadium was no longer watching the real game that was happening there, but they were watching the screen. So now if you go, they will just put the score up on the screen and only show replays on it because people were choosing the simulation over the real life. So I don't know if any of you have watched the show A Baby Story. Has anyone seen this TLC, The Baby Story? It's uh, very sentimental. And my wife and I got really hooked on it. Well, actually, she got really hooked on it when she was pregnant with our, um, with our son. And I would watch it to be supportive. And at the end of it, it's so, yes. It's so sentimental that, you know, it's, it, my, she would cry every time, and I was being supportive, and I would sit in the corner and try not to cry. This is stupid, um, you know, as I try not to cry. It's very sentimental. It's about 22 minutes. Before the first commercial, you meet the, the woman and hear about her plans for the pregnancy. Then after the first commercial, the baby, she goes into labor, the baby is born, commercial. Then the last couple minutes are homecoming. Well, we were into the show, and we went to our car's midwife appointment, and our midwife's name was Ursula, and Ursula was originally from Germany, and she was, she spit nails. I mean, she was tough, 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 and so we were in there, and she was getting some paperwork ready, and I decided I should, you know, have a little small talk, so I said, hey, Ursula, do you ever watch the baby story? And her neck turned around, and she looked at me, and she said, I hate that show. I hate it. I was like, oh my gosh, she's going to kill me right here. This is how I die, right, in, a, in, a, in this office. And she realized she probably was a little bit too intense, so she should explain what she means. She says, no, really, 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 I hate that show. 
And she says, you know, as a midwife, I've had a number of experiences where my job as a midwife is to give the woman the kind of pregnancy she wants to have. And with every woman, I will make a plan with her how she wants this pregnancy to go. And she said, it's happened to me on a number of occasions where the baby will be born, and I always give um, the woman and her partner an, enough time to kind of have their experience. And I come back about a half hour, 45 minutes later, to check on the woman and also to make sure that she's had the kind of experience she's had. So I'll come back into the room, and I'll say to the woman, I'll say, so how were things? And the one woman will say, it was fine. No, no, wait a minute. You seem less than satisfied with this. What happened? No, 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 really, really, it's nothing. It's nothing. No, really, please, tell me what, what's wrong. No, 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 I, I, I can't. It, it's nothing. No, really, it's my job as your midwife to give you the kind of experience you want. Please tell me. It will help me with other women. Well, I don't know. Well, please. Well, it's just, it's just, I don't know. It's just that it, it was nothing like the baby story. So now I have never given birth, believe it or not, um, but I've lived through two of them, and I know they don't happen in 22 minutes. <laughs> the baby story is a simulation of a woman's labor, but it now becomes the measure of the real event. I've, when I do this, uh, and maybe some of you are, this is starting to ring a bell for you, but often when I've done this talk with pastors in the room, they'll run up to me after and say, this is exactly what I experience when a wedding goes wrong. When I have an experience where a wedding goes wrong, it's usually some kind of experience. There's some Hollywood wedding. There's some Kate and Will's wedding. So God have mercy on your soul if you did a, a wedding, you know, uh, a number of months ago. That that becomes the measure of the real thing. You enter into the hyper real. And this works with how we read the biblical text with young people as well. I remember this dates me as well. But when I was uh, in, in youth ministry at one point, we were doing a Bible study and we were reading the psalm. Um, and we walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And every kid in my small group said, wait a minute. That's not the Bible. That's Coolio's Gangster's Paradise. That's what that is. And in a sense, it's true. For them, it is Coolio's Gangster's Paradise because that's what they've made meaning with. And now it becomes my job to have to re redo the structure, to put the structure back together again. Now, why does this matter, actually? We've done a little cute academic little walk, but why does this actually matter? Well, it matters for a few things. Is that when we lose this boundary between the sign and the thing it signifies, it becomes harder to construct meaning because some things get blended together. And the first thing that gets blended together is the real and the fake. It becomes harder to tell what is real and what is fake. And you can just see some examples of this in our larger pop culture. I'm a big fan of the Sasha Baron Cohen movies, Borat and, um, and uh, Bruno. I think they're incredibly funny. But if you've ever watched them, you know it is a completely mind-spinning thing of what's real and what's not. Sasha Baron Cohen is playing a character, but everyone else in the movie are their real people and it's it's a playing with what's real or what's not or the Colbert Report which I'm a big fan of the Colbert Report as well but the interesting thing is Stephen Colbert has now taken that character away from the show itself and onto university campuses is starting to start a super PAC and you don't know who it, and he says he's just playing a character he's just playing a character of a right-wing pundit but it transcends the show itself so who is Stephen Colbert and is he the character or is he not it, he's actually raising real money in the super PAC what's real and what's not real because yeah Yeah, yeah, and you, it's just it, it's a blending of what's real and what's not. Or it becomes harder to decide what is a subject and what's an object. Now, maybe this sounds a little prudish, but when I, you know, even when I was a kid, pornography was not part of pop culture. No late night talk show person would say, "Oh yeah, I, you know, I watched five hours of pornography on the internet this, you know, this last week." Well, there wasn't an internet, but you get my point. Um, but now. Pornography has become part of pop culture, and I think it is this blending of the subject and the object that becomes harder to determine when the sign becomes disconnected from the thing that signifies. Or maybe something really in our, our election season is the true and the false. With all 24-hour news, you start to realize it doesn't matter if it's um, MSNBC or it's Fox News, that you start to realize real quickly they don't care about what's true or false. They just care that I keep consuming images, that I keep watching the advertisement. And it becomes hard to determine what's real and fa false. We lose these boundaries. So Lily Allen, our pop star, says this. She says, I'm a weapon of massive consumption. It's not my fault. It's how I'm programmed to function, which is an interesting comment. And then she says this, which I think is quite profound. I don't want to give her too much credit, but I think it's a profound statement. She says, but I'm not a sinner. She says, but I'm not a sinner, but I'm not a, I'm not a saint, but I'm not a sinner. Now everything's cool as long as I'm getting thinner. I mean, it's a pretty profound statement. Again, I don't want to give her too much credit, but it does ring a bell for us, those of us in the church. I mean, the church for maybe 2,000 years or so, we could kind of assume um, that maybe people didn't like it all the time, but they kind of cared if they were good or bad, if they were going to heaven or hell, if they were a saint or they were a sinner. 
And again, I don't want to give her too much credit, but she just simply says, I don't care. Those categories, they, they don't make any difference to me. It doesn't matter at all to me. What matters to me, what I'm actually living for, is my image. Am I getting thinner? That has more existential depth to me than any of these categories you have. And I think we do run a problem within the church. And again, I don't want to give her too much credit, but we keep on talking about you should care about these categories. You should care about these theological categories. And it's not that young people don't care about the church or even don't care about religion, but it's, it's not that they hate it, actually, as researchers tell us. It's simply that they don't find anything they can make meaning with. Because they're trying to construct meaning around what their body looks like, or they're trying to construct meaning in this different way, and we keep on saying, you should care about this, and they're just like, I, I, I don't know. I might be a saint. I might be a sinner. I don't care. Everything's cool as long as I'm getting thinner. And it means that we really have to change. And it also means that what we do in youth ministry is incredibly important. Because our, the way that we construct and articulate and proclaim the gospel becomes incredibly significant against this backdrop. And most people in the church just keep on saying, oh, these categories, people still care about them, people still care about them. But we know a lot of us that are young people, they just don't. So how do we imaginatively proclaim the gospel in categories that make sense within this cultural context? Well, how do we... You know, how do we think about this? Well, I mean, one thing Lily Allen points to is, again, is it's not that there's no meaning. It's, it's that there's almost too much meaning to construct. And Baudrillard says this kind of in, a, in his great French overstatement, but he says, he says, we are witnesses to an unprecedented evaporation of the ground of meaning. The quest for some division between the real and the unreal, or even the true and the untrue, um, and, the, and the immoral is futile, or the moral and the immoral is futile. Um, now, that's that's some pretty strong words. And Baudrillard is a good French philosopher, so he says, let's just drink wine and die. You know, there's nothing, no point. Let's just drink wine and die. So how do we think about this in the context of the church? And especially if Lily Allen signals some pretty significant cultural changes that leave some of our categories that we've held on to theologically as not unimportant or not um, as, uh, as not as something that young people hate, but that they simply just they don't make any sense to them. Well, I wonder if we think of this little place, maybe the happiest place on earth, Disneyland, isn't actually helpful. Actually, Baudrillard talks about Disneyland in his book Simulation and Simulacra. If you've ever been to a Disney theme park, the most interesting thing about it, what is the first thing you encounter when you go to Disneyland? After you pay $80 to park your car, what's the next thing that you encounter when you go in? What's that? P pictures, yep. But you go through Main Street, right? Like that's the first thing after you go through. The interesting thing is Main Street is a simulacra. In most American cities anymore, there are very few main streets. But in the main street was a simulation of America, Americana Main Street, but it doesn't really exist anymore. And if you spend time in Disneyland, everything within it is a simulation. Everything almost. If anything that, if you go over, if you're at Disneyland and you go over to Tom Sawyer's Island, which has now been rebranded as Pirates of the Caribbean Island, and you spend $90 for a, co a small Coke and a French fry and go over, uh, over there to have a picnic with your kids, any tree over there that your kids can actually climb on is not a real tree. It's cast plastic. Anything you can touch and feel is not real. And even the older rides that, are, that use real trees and real bushes, they've been cut and colored towards the hyperreal. So they're fluorescent pink or yellow. Nothing is real. Now we made a terrible parenting mistake a number of years ago now because Owen was about three and a half and Maisie was um, about six to nine months, like that picture you saw. And we decided we were in Anaheim so we would take them to Disneyland. Really bad mistake. I think you need to be seven or eight to understand the magic of the Magic Kingdom. And I knew I was in trouble when I took the boy into the, the bathroom after two days of trying to convince him that this was a really great experience, all the money I was spending. And I took him into the bathroom and he put his hand under the faucet and the water started. And he took his hand away from the faucet and it stopped. And he wanted to spend 20 minutes doing this and thought this was the coolest thing ever. And I'm saying, the Nemo ride is outside. Don't you want to go to the Nemo ride? And I knew I should have just took the kid to the mall after that experience. You know, like it would save me a ton of money. <laughs> so we took our kids and we were trying to convince them to have a good time. And they were deep into the wines. And now you're really, you know, your, your own father comes out of you. Like, I spent all this money and this is how you're going to act. <laughs> so we decided we needed a ride that would be low key that we could kind of, stuff some sugar in our kids and take a deep breath um, and so we could kind of break the whining, the, the whining that was going on. So we were walking into Frontierland and there's this high school girl up front and she had her little Disney hat on and her cane and she was yelling, the tiki room is open, the tiki room is open. So I walked up to her and said, what's the tiki room? She said, oh, it's a bird show. Said, okay. So we walked into this room, which is probably a quarter of the size of this room. 
And there was a, there was a, uh, a, a net on the ceiling, but it was impeccably clean. And I thought, man, Disney cleans up quickly after a bird show. And I knew that was true at Disney. Like, if you get bored at a Disney park, you throw popcorn on the ground and go, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, and somebody will come up and sweep it up before you get to 15. So I thought, wow, Disney, I mean, this is spectacular how quickly they clean up. So it gets near to the show, and the, the high school girl comes in, and I'm thinking to myself, they are going to let a high school girl run this bird show? I mean, this is, these are like killer predator birds. And she, sure enough, she does. She says, we're ready to begin. Tink, 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 puts her cane down on the ground. She says, Pedro, begin. In Pedro, a green parrot starts the bird show. But Pedro comes out of the wall, and he's not a real bird. He's better than a real bird. He's an animatronic robot bird who tells jokes and dances, and now the walls are alive. And these are, this is a great bird show. I mean, these things actually sing and dance, and they don't poop. I mean, there's no mess. It's perfectly pristine. It was an incredible, you know, an incredible experience. So after about 15 minutes, it's over, but my kids are still really whining. I mean, the whines have set in deeply, so we know we need to take a break. So we walk out, and we see a sign to a petting zoo. And we have to follow these fake, big, orange cast uh, rocks. But we follow it around, and we, we round the corner, and we see it. And it scares the hell out of me. It was a real goat. A <laughs> real goat. And then I'll pick, I knew we, we need to stop for an announcement, so I will, we will pick it up there with the real goat. Now program, we wouldn't be here were it not for the support of uh, the dean. And I want you to introduce you to a really great friend of ministry and youth ministry and a lifetime pastor. Uh, it's Dean Greg Sterling of the Elder Center. I just wanted to say welcome on behalf of the Divinity School to all of you. You are playing an absolutely vital role in the future of Christianity. Um, you probably know the statistics, statistics as well as I do, but 50% of the people who've grown up in mainline Protestant denominations have left. 50% uh, of the American populace is, I believe, under the age of 34. You, in your work, represent where the future of Christianity lies. And one of our ambitions is to help make sure that Christianity, which engages society rationally and is open to society and to that engagement, is alive and well. And I think you play an absolutely vital role in that. I salute you for your work. We're grateful you're here, and I wish you the very best. A special thank you to Andy uh, for coming and for participating uh, and leading the discussion for his special talents and his work with you. And I will also say a special word of commendation to Skip. Uh, he's been phenomenally successful at New Canaan, and he helps the Center mm. for Faith and Cultures, but he also helps the Divinity School. He's on our board of advisors. So it, it's a real mm. pleasure to work with Skip, to have Andy here, and to say a very warm welcome to all of you. God bless you in your work. Uh, you will be in my prayers, and I hope that I will be in yours. Thank you very much. So like I said, we round this corner, and there it was, this goat. It was a real goat. Now, I'm not somebody who is freaked out by animals or anything, but I noticed myself as I walked up to this petting zoo, and I kept walking up and seeing this goat, and I would nudge Cara and say, Cara, look at the goat. It's real. She thought I was on drugs or something. Like, yes, that's a real goat. But it actually did really freak me out. And I went up to it and I kind of touched it. And like I said, I'm not like sheepish around animals. Um, <laughs> see, see the pun? You get it? Um, and and I, but I went, went to went to touch this goat and, and I felt myself kind of nervous by it. And I think what had happened is that I had spent so much time saturated in the hyper real that when reality punctured it, when reality showed up. I didn't know what to do. And it was actually a real shock to my being. And when we think about this in the context of our youth ministries, I mean, one of the ways we could take this is say, well, our young people live in a, this hyper-real image-based society, so what we need to do is we need to compete in the hyper-real. 
that we need to make our youth groups as hyper real as we can. You got to get a really great website. You've got to make yourself a really sexy avatar. I don't know. You got to do something to, to compete within the hyper real. And you can try it and let me know how it goes. But my guess is it's not going to go too well. Um, or maybe the way we imagine what we do in our youth groups and even in our churches is to articulate and give space for young people to search for God up against the real. That when the goat shows up, like when they say, my parents just told me they're getting a divorce. Or when the young woman says, I know I shouldn't care about my body, but I just hate the way I look. That reality punctures. That this becomes the place where we, I think we really start to talk about faith. We start to wrestle with it. If the church's job is to compete with the hyper real, I don't think it's going to happen. And to be quite honest, the irony of this presentation is we've been talking about images and I've been showing you nothing but images. That in some sense, there's no way out of this. And no one's taking my TV away, necessarily. But we have to find a way to dig deep into the faith and articulate the faith up against this hyper-real. And I don't think it's necessarily an idea of competition, but a way to talk about when reality punctures the hyper-real. Because at some point, it will. At some point, your boyfriend will leave you. At some point, your, one of your parents may get sick. And often, when young people have those experiences, they don't end up finding the church as a place to articulate those, to find hope in the midst of those, to actually wrestle with those. It's very interesting that our pop star, Lily Allen, I've shown you um, her, her verses, but her chorus says this. It says, it says, please replace the lamp. But on top of that, it says, um, I don't know what's right or what's real anymore, which is interesting. She doesn't say, I don't know what's right or wrong. She says, I don't know what's right or real anymore. I don't know how I'm meant to feel anymore. When do you think it will all become clear because I'm being overtaken by the fear? Her question isn't what's morally right, what's morally wrong. She's, she's not about that, but she does have a deep question of what's real? Who am I? What, where is my being held? These are actually her questions of being. Where do I belong? Where, who holds me? Um, what does it mean for me to be me? What is my lifetime and why do I live it? And I think our ministries have to pull into this depth with young people, especially in a hyper-real world. Two stories, and I'm going to show you one more film clip and we'll be done. But um, it's interesting that Parker Palmer reports this study that had been done. And I think it's an interesting connection for us. that A, a study was done at university campuses on what it was that allowed undergraduates to really like a class. Like, what was it in the class that led them to really like it? And they didn't know what it was, so they would interview them, and they thought maybe it was the content. So they would interview students who had just finished Physics 101, and they asked them, did you like physics? I mean, did you like this class? They said, I love this class. Well, did you like physics? No, I will never take another physics class again. I, I, I know. And then they thought, well, maybe it was performance. So they said, so did you like this class? Yes, I like this class. Well, did you do well in it? No, I barely passed. Like I had to get, you know, I had to get a C on the last exam to, to, pass, to pass. So they, they probed and probed, and they decided there was one variable that determined if an undergraduate liked the class or not. And the one variable was this, the student's perception that it mattered to the professor. It's fascinating. Part of the problem with mainline loss, part of the problem as the dean articulated of the loss of young people within the main line is they're just not so sure this matters to us. They're just not so sure. And sometimes they wonder, I, don't, I think this is more tacit than explicit, but sometimes they wonder if the youth ministry itself exists just to be a holding pen for them not to have to face the, the real as it, as it crushes into their life. If it's a way to actually hide them from having to face it. And I think one of the turns that we take, especially in a hyper-real world, is to really make this the curriculum that we reflect on with young people. And it has to matter to us. We have to be those who are digging deeply into the faith itself, seeking for God in the midst of our own questions and articulating them. It's interesting that I was uh, asked to go to Southern California to be an outside observer on a youth ministry. What, what really had happened was that this church, a fairly large Presbyterian church, wanted to fire their junior high pastor, young woman, um, but they felt like they needed justification, so they needed an outside quote-unquote expert to say, yeah, she's terrible, you should fire her. So it was a trip to Southern California in January, so it seemed a little bit like George Clooney up in the air, but I was okay with that. I could get out of the cold, so I took the trip, which probably wasn't the best idea, but I took it. And I walked into their Wednesday night junior high um, event, and there were about 60 kids there. And I sat in the corner, kind of a fly on the wall, and it was pure 100% chaos. 
I mean, it was awful. The boys were all in the back wrestling with each other. Literally, the boys were trying to run up the wall. They would run as fast as they could and then see how high they get the wall and then mark it and then another one. This is, and this isn't before it starts. She's trying to lead worship. She's trying to give announcements. And this is what these boys are doing. They're taking their chairs. I mean, these are good Southern California boys and they're trying to surf on the back of their chairs so they get the back two legs going and are trying to surf on it. And then they, try, they start kicking each other in the head. Literally, like a boy would stand like this and they would kick. And then they say, oh, dude, you're like this close before you're kicking. They were seeing how close they could get. This was happening while she was doing this. The girls were all huddled, passing notes and talking. And I'm thinking to myself, she's getting fired. Like, this is bad. There, no one's listening to her. And it was an awful, awful train wreck until the last five minutes. The last five minutes, she grabbed the mic and she said, now we're going to pray like we pray. And oddly, all the kids were silent. And then a young woman raised her hand, eighth grader. She stood up and awkwardly said, yeah, um, I guess I just need prayer because I'm dealing with it again. I had no idea what it was, but clearly the rest of the group did. She sat down, an adult leader kind of touched her shoulder. Some kids looked at her. Another kid raised his hand, passed the mic. That kid prayed for her. Then another kid raised his hand and said, yeah, like some of you probably like know, he's from California, like um, my mom was diagnosed, her cancer's back, so like I need prayer for that. Another kid raised their hand, prayed for that kid. Went on for about five minutes. She grabbed the mic. She prayed for the group and said, amen. And the boys literally went back to trying to kick each other in the head. But it was beautiful. They asked me the next day with, you know, blood, with, with, with blood on their teeth, like, should we, should we fire her? Should we fire her? I said, no. It's perfect. What should we change? Nothing. It's beautiful. Here are these kids actually articulating and sharing each other's lives and turning to God in the midst of it, wrestling with the goat. What more could we have? Could she have used some help on organizing the night? She, could she could use some communication? Of course she could. But at the end of the day, what matters is to really wrestle with the depth of these questions. So I want to show you one last video clip and forgive my overindulgence, but it's TV, so we can do one more. This comes from the movie Walk the Line with uh, the biopic about Johnny Cash. I'm sure some of you have seen it. And this is early on when Johnny Cash is trying to get a record deal. And as you watch it, you won't need much setup. He's, he's going to kind of audition for this. But what I want you to do is um, do a little thing for me, is that every time Johnny Cash or this record producer that he's talking to, every time that he says song, I want you to replace it in your mind with whatever you do in ministry, whether it's preach a sermon, whether it's lead a youth talk, whether it's lead youth group, whether it's lead Bible study, whatever you do, I want you to replace in your mind song with Bible study youth talk, um, sermon, and then we'll talk about it for a second. Excuse me, sir. You the owner of this place? That's me. Hello, I'm J.R. Cash. Sam. Well, good to meet you, Mr. Phillips. I'm a singer, and uh, I got a band. We've, we've been working on some songs. You want to cut a record, son? It's $4. Well, what about the guys there on the wall in the, in the pictures? I mean, they pay for it all? They're on my label. Well, how do I get on there? The audition. Right now? Call my secretary, Marion, when she comes back. She's at the salon. Phil says you have an appointment next month. Well, I can't wait that long, Mr. Phillips. Excuse me. I can't wait that long. What about this one? I can iron it. John, you can't wear that one. It's black. It's the only color shirt we all have. Nothing wrong with black. It looks like you're going to a funeral. Maybe I am. Yes, I know when Jesus saved me. Saved my soul. The very moment he forgave me. Gave me he took away my heavy burden. Lord, he gave me peace with him. Peace with him. Well, Satan can't make me doubt it. I won't doubt it. Thrill and I'm gonna shout it. I'm gonna shout it. Well, I'm Hold on. There Hold with. on. I hate to interrupt, but you guys got something else. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I can't market gospel. I don't record material that doesn't sell, Mr. Cash, and gospel like that. 
done this out. So that the gospel is a way of singing. Both. So what's wrong with the way I sing? I don't believe you. I mean, we come down here, we play for a minute, and he tells me I don't believe in God. You know exactly what I'm telling you. We've already heard that song a hundred times, just like that, just like how you sang it. Well, he doesn't let us bring it home. <laughs> bring it home? All right, let's bring it home. If you was hit by a truck, and you was lying out in that gutter dying, and you had time to sing one song, one song people would remember before your dirt. One song that would let God know what you felt about your time here on earth. One song that would sum you up. You telling me that's the song you'd sing. That same Jimmy Davis tune we hear on the radio all day. About your peace within and how it's real and how you're going to shout it. Or would you sing something different? Something real. Something you felt. And I'm telling you right now, that's the kind of song people want to hear. That's the kind of song that truly saves people. It ain't got nothing to do with believing in God, Mr. Cash. It has to do with believing in yourself. Well, I got a couple songs I wrote in the Air Force. You got anything against the Air Force? train of coming it's rolling around the bend and I ain't seen the sunshine I don't know when I'm stuck in Folsom prison and time keeps dragging on That train keeps a rolling on down to San Antonio. When I was just a baby, my mama told me, son, always be a good boy, don't ever play with guns, but I've got a man in Reno. Just to watch him die When I hear that whistle blowing I hang my head and cry I bet there's rich folks eating In a fancy dining car They're probably drinking coffee And smoking big cigars Well, I know I had it coming I know I can't be free But those people keep a moving And that's what tortures me Powerful, powerful scene. And I do think that we have a generation of young people who are really asking us, really? Is that really what you're going to tell me? That same old Bible study, that same old youth talk, that same old worship experience, or are you going to say something real? And I think that becomes a challenge for us, especially against the backdrop of this hyper-real world where actually our talks, that our practice of ministry can so easily become just simulated fodder that just is against the tapestry of all the other images. But what might it mean to actually articulate the gospel in a way that actually saves us? That has young people see us wrestling with the faith. That really actually wrestles with the experiences of the goat in their own life. And I think that becomes the challenge for us. 
And I think we have to think a lot about the practices we do in our youth ministry. We have to think a lot about how we communicate, how we organize our calendars and things like that. But all of that is secondary to us actually really wrestling with the faith ourselves. That's really seeking God up against the goats in our own lives and the goats in their life. So let's pray. And after we pray, I think we'll have a few minutes. I know people probably, some need to go, but uh, we'll have some time for some Q&A. So let me pray for us. God, I thank you for these people. And I thank you for the incredible blessing they are to the church. And I thank you for their depth, the depth of, of courage they have to seek for you, God, up against deep questions and deep fears in young people's lives. We pray today, God, that we might ourselves wrestle with the gospel, knowing that if we wrestle with it, that we will find you faithful. So give us the courage to do this, God, and bless us with endurance. Thanks for these people. Amen.